Welcome to everyone. I'm James Jensen, today's webinar chair. I'm a contractor supporting the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs Tribal Energy Webinar Series. Today's webinar, titled Fundamentals of the Tribal Energy Industry, is the first webinar of the 2019 DOE Tribal Energy Webinar Series. Let's go over some event details. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on DOE's Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs website, along with copies of today's PowerPoint presentations. They will be available in about one week. Everyone will receive a post-webinar email with the link to the page where the slides and recording will be located. Because we are recording this webinar, all phones have been muted. We will answer your written questions at the end of both the first and final presentation. You can submit a question at any time by clicking on the question button located in the webinar control box on your screen and typing your question. Let's get started with some opening remarks from Lavana Pierce. Ms. Pierce is an Senior Engineer and Deployment Supervisor in the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs, duty stationed in Golden, Colorado. Lazana is responsible for managing technical assistance and education and outreach activities on behalf of the office, implementing national funding opportunities, and administering the resultant tribal energy project grants and agreements. She has 25 years of experience in project development and management and has been assisting tribes in developing their energy resources for nearly 20 years. She holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Colorado, from Colorado State University and pursued a Master's in Business Administration through the University of Northern Colorado. Lizana, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, James, and hello, everyone. I join James in welcoming you to the first webinar of the 2019 series. This webinar series is sponsored by the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs, otherwise referred to as the Office of Indian Energy for short. The Office of Indian Energy directs, fosters, coordinates, and implements energy planning, education, management, and programs that assist tribes with energy development, capacity building, energy infrastructure, energy costs, and electrification of Indian lands and homes. To provide this assistance, our deployment program works within the Department of Energy, across government agencies, and with Indian tribes and organizations to help Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages overcome the barriers to energy development. Our deployment program is composed of a three-prong approach consisting of financial assistance, technical assistance, and education and capacity building. This energy this Tribal Energy webinar series is just one example of our education and capacity building efforts. This webinar series, part of the Office of Indian Energy's efforts to support fiscally responsible energy business and economic development decision making and information sharing among tribes, is intended to provide attendees with information on tools and resources to develop and implement tribal energy plans, programs, and projects. It's also intended to highlight tribal energy case studies and identify business strategies that tribes can use to expand their energy options and develop sustainable local economies. Given that today's webinar is the first of the 2019 series, we decided to take a step back and cover energy industry basics to lay a strong foundation for the rest of the series. So this webinar is intended for individuals who are new to energy uh, and where understanding energy jargon and energy concepts can be barriers to getting started. The webinar will provide individuals with an introduction to energy and familiarize attendees with important concepts and ter terminology. Attendees will also learn about publicly available resources that can help build their energy knowledge base. We hope the webinar and webinar series is useful to you, and we also welcome your feedback. So please let us know if there are ways that we could make the series better. And with that, I'll turn the virtual floor back to James. James?
Rosanna, it looks like we lost James. That's what I was wondering. Okay, so. So James is back. I apologize for that. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, thank you. Sorry okay. about that, everyone. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Lizana. On today's agenda, we have three presentations. I will introduce all of the presenters now. Our first presenter is uh, Pete Miller. Pete started his career in the electrical utility industry in 1986 after completing four years of service in the United States Marine Corps. Working at Southern California Edison Company, he worked his way up to electrical systems operations from substation operations in the Long Beach District to a transmission system operator at a major 500 kV intertie between Southern California Edison and PG&E out in the high desert of Los Angeles County. As California transitioned to a deregulated utility, the first in the nation, all utilities in the state shuffled assets around in an attempt to find a new normal. After the shuffle, Pete found himself in Anoka, Minnesota, working for a rural electric cooperative. Shortly after that, Pete was hired by the Department of Energy, Western Area Power Administration in Watertown, South Dakota the upper Great Plains region as a transmission system operator, working with the federal power system in Montana, North Dakota, and Northern Minnesota. After a short stay in South Dakota, Pete transferred to WAPA's Sierra Nevada region office in Folsom, California. Since 1998, Pete has held various positions in the operations office, generation energy scheduling, e-tagging system, and transmission switching. Currently, Pete is the operations trainer. Pete has been involved in DOE ESF-12 and FEMA, slash FEMA program for the last 10 years as a field responder and regional coordinator to assist FEMA in federal declared national emergencies with a focus on energy infrastructure system restoration. Pete has been a NERC certified system operator for over 20 years. Pete will not be able to stay on for the entire webinar, so we will uh, answer questions for him immediately after his presentation. Following Pete, we will hear from Tony Jimenez. Tony has been at NREL since 1996. He has experience in performance and economic modeling of wind, PV, and hybrid systems, system projects, project pre-feasibility analysis, wind data analysis, economic impact analysis, and project management. His current assignments include coordinating NREL activities under the DOE Tribal Technical Assistance Program and providing support to various DOD projects. Past NREL work includes leading the Small Wind Regional Test Center project and the analysis of the potential economic impacts of large-scale renewable energy development, administration of the Native American Anemometer Loan Program, renewable energy project pre-feasibility analysis on behalf of a variety of clients and support for the Air Force in its efforts to increase the resiliency of the electric and electrical energy infrastructure on Air Force installations. Tony is a retired Army Reserve engineer officer. In his two overseas deployments, he served as a project manager with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Iraq and as director of public works for U.S. Army installations in Kuwait. Our final presenter will be Travis Lauder. Travis is a project manager with the Integrated Application Center at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, focusing on policy and finance, distributed energy resource innovations, and decision support for policymakers via analysis and training. Prior to joining the Integrated Application Center, Travis served as the head of policy and regulatory affairs for a national solar company coordinating the company's internal strategy with the dynamics of the external solar market. He began his career as an analyst with NREL's Strategic Energy Analysis Center, performing both qualitative and quantitative analyses on a range of renewable energy technologies and markets. Travis has a Master's of Arts in International Development from the University of Denver. So with that, we will jump to uh, our first presenter, Pete Miller's presentation. Pete, as soon as it comes up, you're, uh, you're welcome to start.
Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Pete Miller. I work for Western Area Power Administration in Sierra Nevada region in Folsom, California. I'm going to talk to you today about interconnected system operations and the people who operate it and the equipment you might find in a substation and power plants. Next slide. I have one objective today. I would like for you guys to be able to obtain a better understanding of how the electrical grid functions in order to ask the right questions and to formulate a plan to become an active member of the interconnected electrical grid. So here's a basic structure of the electrical system. Starting on the left side of the screen, you can see we have a, a power plant. And uh, from there, they create electricity and then it's transformed. Uh, normally we create electricity, generally speaking around 13.8 kV, and then it steps up through the transformer up to a transmission voltage and that voltage can range between 230 to 115, 69 kV. And from there it's, it's tapped off to the transmission customer and it eventually heads to a substation. From that substation, the, the voltage is stepped down to a, a different level and uh, from that point, it's sent out to the end user. So what we're gonna talk about today is some of those pieces of equipment that uh, is outlined in this graphic and some, some of the folks that are responsible for, for operating the bulk electric system reliably. Next slide, please. Okay, overall, here's a picture of uh, the federal government's uh, involvement in the electrical system. Uh, WAPA is just one of the four power marketing administrations. There's another organization out there called Tennessee Valley Authority. It's not on this slide, uh, but we have in the lower right-hand corner, we have the Southeast Power Administration. And then we have in the middle of the country there, we have the Southwest Power Administration. They're based, uh, headquarters based out of Oklahoma. And then in the upper left, we have Bonneville Power Administration. And uh, of course, in the middle in the blue there, we have the Western Area Power Administration and uh, our headquarters are in Lakewood, Colorado. Next slide. So here's the different regions of WAPA. Like uh, James had said, uh, I started my career with DOE in the Upper Great Plains region and they're headquartered in Billings, Montana, their operations office in Watertown, South Dakota. Uh, our headquarters, you can see in Lakewood, Colorado. And then we have the Rocky Mountain Region Operations Control Center in Loveland, Colorado. And then we have the CS or CRSP office, and they're based out of Utah. Then uh, we have the Desert Southwest Region, and they're based out of Phoenix. And then uh, my region is on the left there, Sierra Nevada Region, and we're headquartered in Folsom, California. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, back one slide, please. So here it is. Here is North America. So basically, um, these are the four interconnections. And so over here in the West, we have the WECC, the Western Interconnection. And then there in the, the, we have the Eastern Interconnection, and then we have the Quebec interconnection, and then we have the Electric Liability Council of Texas. Texas is, is separate from the rest of the United States. And uh, back in the old days, whatever that means to you, they tried to run uh, a, a transmission line from North Carolina to California. They were unsuccessful. The voltage was, was virtually non-existent at the other end of the line. It's just impossible to do. So engineering folks back in the day decided that we should break our interconnection into different pieces. Now, between the Western interconnection and the Midwestern part of the United States, there's a handful of DC converter stations. Our electrical system is a three phase AC system. You'll learn a little bit more about that in the next presentations, but basically we use alternating current electricity. And we want to transfer power from the west to the east. And so we do do it through a DC converter station. When I was in Watertown, South Dakota, there was a Mile City, Montana DC converter station that I was responsible for. And 
you can transfer on that particular station from zero to 200 megawatts across that path. And so we've got, I believe there's nine between the west and the east, different DC ties. And there's a couple of DC ties between Texas and uh, the eastern interconnection. Next question, please, or next slide. So who is it that's responsible for operating the electrical system? The one person I left off of here is the lineman. And uh, it's a very notable and hard profession and their linemen are great people. But I wanted to focus uh, today on the people who actually operate it. Uh, linemen and electricians are responsible for repairing the equipment and they do great work. But the, the, the handful of people I'm talking about will be the transmission system operator, the automatic generation control operator, the transmission scheduling and security operator, the distribution system operator, and the generation operator. And then there's this position that came in about 20 years ago called the reliability coordinator. And I'll just touch a little bit on some of their responsibilities. Next slide, please. So the transmission operator, he's the guy that uh, is responsible for the transmission, the substation side of the house and the higher voltage type of uh, equipment. Uh, keeping the transmission substation equipment at peak performing capability is the number two priority. His number one priority is the safety of the worker, the safety of the public and the safety of the worker. And what I mean by the field worker, I mean the electricians, meter relay technicians, and the line crews. Next slide. Monitoring the bulk electric system, uh, enabling, enabling personnel to respond immediately to emergency situations so that uncontrolled separation will not happen with the loss of a single element. So what does that really mean? Say, for example, if we had a 500 kV line that trips, we operate our system to keep the loss of one line in electrical system from causing a cascading outage or to cause the system to go unstable. Especially if the next line could create that stability issue, uh, the TSO makes sure that the system is ready for the next line loss. Next slide, please. The automatic generation control uh, operator, that person has a view. Uh, of the system and I like to comp compare the AGC operator like a pilot flying the plane and the pilot is the heart of the plane and the pilot is charged with maintaining the balance of the plane and so in the automatic generation control operator's job that balance is the balance of the bulk electric system that means the balance of load and generation and so the load is the, the electricity that our customers use and it's generated uh, from hydro plants primarily and also the Army Corps of Engineers uh, hydroelectric facilities. So load and generation must always be balanced. The trick here for the AGC operator is balanced at 60 hertz, 60 cycles. In the United States, the standard to maintain that balance of load and generation is at 60 cycles. And I can tell you that load and generation will always be balanced but the key is to keep it at 60 cycles. If it settles at 58, we're gonna damage equipment. Next slide, please. So here's a graphic. Uh, what preference would you prefer for balance? Like I said, AGC is like flying a plane. On the left side of the wing, I have the scheduling side of the house. On the right side, I have the transmission. If all the schedules are flowing like they're supposed to and the transmission lines are in service, we're flying perfectly. Uh, when we lose a line or we lose a generator, then we start to have a flame out and the, and, and the plane starts to tilt. I don't know if anyone's experienced a tilting plane. I have in the Marine Corps. It was not a good experience. But how we do that in real-time operations, you can see on the lower left-hand side of the screen, that's our ACE chart. And so the, you can see a faint red line, and that's the zero line. As long as that green line squiggles up and down across that red line as time passes, we're doing pretty good. If that line starts to go below that red line and goes south for quite some time, uh, we're in a dive and the system might go a little unstable. So his job to keep that balance of load and generation is going across that zero line as time progresses through, through the day. Next slide, please. And the, the third position that you'll find in every utility control room is the transmission scheduling and security. That person is uh, responsible to make sure the energy schedules flow on the transmission lines and the customers have the rights 
of flow power across the transmission system. Energy scheduled to flow on the transmission system is scheduled using an electronic tag system referred to as an E-tag. Energy moved across boundaries with other entities must also be E-tagged. If a tag is missing or incorrect, the system will start to go out of balance. If you can think about that graphic where the airplane starts to dive a little bit one way or the other. And so these tags are fed into that automatic generation control system, and that's how we keep the balance on the system. Next slide, please. So another important individual that helps maintain reliability of the bulk electric system is the distribution operator. A lot of times these are municipalities and um, rural electric cooperatives, and they provide the and operates the wires between the transmission system and the end use customer. For end use customers who are served by transmission voltages, sometimes the transmission operator and the distribution provider or operator can be the same thing. For example, at Southern California Edison, uh, you have transmission operators and distribution operators, and they work for the same company. In that example, that's an investor-owned utility. Next slide. And then we have the generator operator. Like, say, for us at WAPA, it's either the Bureau of Reclamation or the Army Corps of Engineers. That's the entity that operates the generating units and performs the function of supplying energy to the interconnected uh, operation services. And that's also the entity that owns and maintains the generating units. Next slide, please. Uh, and the last position I want to talk about is a reliability coordinator. That's the guy who's responsible for the overall safe, stable, and reliable operation of the bulk electric system. They have a wide area of view of the bulk electric system, and uh, they have a special set of tools and processes and procedures, and they also are given the authority by NERC to prevent or mitigate emergency operation situations uh, but in both the next day analysis and real-time operations. So, for example, in the WAPA system, if we need to take a transmission element out of service, we will coordinate that with our neighbors and also with the reliability coordinator. Next slide, please. So here's some typical voltage levels that you'll find on the grid. Uh, let's start at the top. We have the extra high voltage. Here in the Western Air Connection, our EHB system is 500 kV and some 345 kV. I know that in the Eastern interconnection, uh, they have some 765 kV. The reason we have an extra high voltage system is so we can transfer more power greater distances. Uh, every electrical circuit has some type of loss and uh, to help minimize those losses, we have to crank up the voltage to a higher level. And uh, because power plants traditionally are a long ways away from the end use customer. And then we have just your high voltage transmission system, 230 kV, 161, 138, 115, 92 kV. And again, this is not all inclusive. There's uh, some other oddball voltages you might see out there. Then you have a sub transmission system, which is 69 kV, 60 kV, 34, 5 kV. And then we kind of get down into the neighborhoods, uh, 21 kV, 16 kV, 13 kV, 12 and 4 kV. Again, this is not an all inclusive list. Next slide, please. Okay, I know this is kind of hard to read. I apologize for that. But this is typical equipment that you'll find on the grid. So on the left, I have the category of substations. And then on the right, I have lines and power plants. So you can see that some of the uh, equipment You'll same type of equipment you'll find in a substation that you'll find on a transmission line or in a power plant. For example, in substations you'll find reactors. You can find reactors out on on lines, and you can find reactors in power plant. You can you can look at this list, and you can hop on Google and you can Google some of these uh, devices to take a look and see what their functionality is all about. Uh, a capacitor, for example, if you put a capacitor in service whether you're talking a line, a substation, or a power plant, that's going to increase the voltage on a line. And then if you remove that from service, it's going to lower the voltage on a, on a line or a piece of equipment. Next slide. So here's a physical perspective. This is a picture of a little pumping plant near Fresno, California. The line crew was in a bucket, and they snapped this photo for me. And so the field worker out there who's working on equipment, 
this is what it looks like to them. The line comes in at the top of the screen. It kind of goes left and goes through a circuit breaker and then split on a little jack bus and then it feeds down to a pumping plant where there's a couple of transformers. Next slide, please. Here's what we call a single line perspective. So that's the same as what we just saw in the last picture. And so on the left side of the screen, you can see a couple of pole switches, pole switch 17 and 19. It's a 60 kV or 70 kV line. Comes in through some metering uh, potential transformers and current transformers so we can see how much load's flowing through there. And then 1154 is an example of a circuit breaker and then a bypass disconnect and it swings over to the right and there we have a couple examples of uh, some 70 kV to 4.16 uh, 4 kV transformers down to the pumping plant. This is what your system operator looks like when he's going to be working on the equipment. Next slide, please. So almost every utility has a SCADA. It stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. It's part of an energy management system. And what a SCADA system does for you, it allows the system operators to operate the equipment remotely. This is a completely different station. This is not the one we looked at in the two previous slides. But here you can see that uh, we can select the common thing you want to see is you see the red squares. Those are circuit breakers. So the system operator can click on that and open that breaker and de-energize the line. And this happens to be 500 kV. Next slide, please. So here's another system line of the federal power system in Northern California. On the left side of this map is Oregon. There's a little station up there called Captain Jack. It's an intertie between the California Independent System Operator and uh, Bonneville Power Administration. This is the system that I'm, I'm responsible for. It's a beast. It's a big system. It goes all the way from Oregon all the way down to Turlock, which is south of San Francisco and inland a little bit. Next slide, please. So here's where our arrow was in the last slide, and we're taking a look at Folsom substation, which is a 230 to 115 kV substation, and it has three generators on it. They're owned by the Bureau of Reclamation, and they are our Black Start resource. One of my specialties is system restoration, and so most utilities have a Black Start generator. What I mean by Black Start is they can start without power from the grid, because when we lose voltage and frequency on the system and the system blacks out, then we have to start the system up. And what we do is we have a generator that's capable of starting without power from the grid. Normally, generators use power from the grid to start. But when, when we have no voltage and frequency, how do we do it? Well, we have sources built within the station to start it without power from the grid. Next slide, please. So uh, here's an example of substation, and it's a collection of various equipment starting on the left side of the screen. It comes in on a 34.5 kV line, and it goes down in through a couple of disconnects and some other devices, and it ends up in a circuit breaker. That's right. It's just a larger version of the circuit breaker you'll find in your panel at your house. And it steps over into the middle of the page there, a step-down transformer, steps it down to... I believe a 7.2 kV distribution line, and it goes through a voltage regulator, and then another 12 kV or a 7 kV circuit breaker, and then it steps out on the distribution system on the right. So sometimes folks ask me, how can I tell the difference between 34.5 kV and 12 kV? Well, the higher the voltage, the further apart the lines will be. So if you're heading across the nation and you're looking at transmission towers and it looks like the three-phase electrical system, the conductors are bundled or they're spread out really far, really far apart, chances are they're a higher voltage like high voltage or maybe EHB transmission line. Next slide, please. So power plants, there's a variety of facilities that can generate electricity. Here's a few examples, coal, natural gas, hydroelectric, nuclear, we got uh, wind, solar, and then we also have diesel. 
So the location of these uh, generators uh, from the from the end users it, it varies widely. Next slide, please. Uh, the technologies in which we create energy is also physically different, and they are used to manipulate differently on the power grid as a result. For example, certain types of power plants uh, we may keep base loaded, like coal plants and nuclear plants. We what we do is they're not very flexible, so we run them at base load. So, for example, uh, a thousand megawatt nuclear plant we may always run it at 900 megawatts. So they don't respond to system deviations very well. For example, hydroelectric power plants, they, they respond well to frequency deviations, so we'll use those guys across the peak of the day because they're a little bit more flexible on how we adjust them. Next slide, please. So here's what I talked about where different types of uh, generation can handle the swings and the changes of the load pattern throughout the day. So. Uh, your renewable resources such as wind and solar, those are, are excellent sources of power. Unfortunately, they, they come with some challenges. A lot of the times with wind, when it gets hot, the wind stops blowing, and then the utilities are faced with uh, having the reserve uh, uh, adequate reserve margin to back up those renewable resources. Next slide, please. So what is a transmission line? Transmission lines are necessary to carry high voltage electricity over long distances and connect generators with the customers. They're either overhead or underground uh, power cables. Uh, the challenges with underground systems are they have to be oil cooled and they have to be, the oil has to be circulated. And so some of those pumping facilities uh, are fed by the distribution system. So there are special characteristics that come with underground transmission power cables. Overheads are uh, not insulated with oil. They're just air-cooled, but they're also susceptible to weather, lightning strikes, and those type of things. And when those lines trip out because of lightning, uh, the system operator, again, has got to keep the system stable. Next slide, please. Here's uh, some examples of power plants. On the left, we have coal. And on the right, we have uh, a nuclear plant. Next slide. On the left, we have a hydroelectric facility, hydroelectric dam. On the right, we have a, a, a typical natural gas plant. Next slide. So what is the distribution system? The di distribution system is a network uh, of wires that basically go from the transmission substation and they go to the end customer which is the home, schools, and businesses. The grid comes to an end when electricity finally gets to the consumer, allowing us to turn our lights on and watch television and charge our, our uh, cellular devices. Next slide. So uh, one of the big pieces of uh, equipment that is out there on the system is the transformer. They come in various sizes. And again, they can either step it up to a different voltage level or step it down. Uh, transformers are really expensive and hard to come by the bigger they get. Your average pole top tr transformer that we'll take a look at here in a couple minutes, those are, are fairly inexpensive to uh, maintain and replace. But when you talk about power transformers at EHV substations, those things take years to build and so uh, they're kind of costly. Next slide, please. So what do we see in this picture here? Well, the, the first thing I'd like to focus on is that green box. That's pretty quick. The green box right there, that's a transformer. That's a, what we call a pad mounted transformer. It feeds underground service to the homes behind it. And in front of it is also another part, type of in, infrastructure. It's the water meter for those houses. Next slide, please. So what am I seeing here? I see the same exact thing. Let's start on the left. Yes, that is a yellow Camaro and it's a transformer, it's Bumblebee. It's a transformer, but not the type of transformer that I'm talking about. In the example in the middle there, we have a 500 kV line reactor that looks like a transformer, but its purpose as a reactor, as I said a few slides ago, was to, uh, if you put a reactor in, it lowers the voltage if you remove the reactor from surface, 
uh, service, it raises the voltage. And then on the right is your traditional um, 115 kV stepping it down to 12 kV transformer. Next slide, please. So I got the same thing in this picture as the last slide. I have a bunch of transformers. On the truck there, that's a picture of some transformers over in Saipan when we uh, responded last year to Hurricane uh, or Typhoon Wu Tip and uh, or Wu Tu. And then on the right, we have a typical pole mounted transformer. And so it comes in single phase there, it goes through the fuse and comes into that transformer. And on the right side of that can, the can is the transformer, there's insulated wires, service wires that go to the house. And you can see past that transformer is what they call a weather head. And that's where the overhead connection is made and goes into the customer's meter. Next slide, please. Here's a, like I call an abnormal situation. What happens to transformers after typhoons, hurricanes, and tornadoes, and those type of things uh, go through an area? These are pictures from uh, St. Croix after Hurricane Maria in 2017. I was deployed for that. And uh, you can't really see it in the picture on the left, but there's conductors that are attached to that. And uh, it's always safe to, you know, recognize those hazards and avoid them. Next slide, please. So what is a circuit breaker? What's its purpose? It's as simple as it breaks a circuit. A circuit breaker is an is automatically operated electrical switch designed to protect some electrical circuit or equipment from damage caused by excessive current from an overload or a short circuit. The basic function is to interrupt current flow after a fault is detected. Next slide, please. So here's something that's very familiar. Uh, this is the panel uh, at my house. So at the top of the, the gray box there is my main circuit breaker, and then below it are the different circuit breakers that are like little mini distribution circuits in my house. And so if I open that, that breaker on the top, the very top one, uh, my house is de-energized. Next slide. So now, how does the circuit breaker look on the grid? How does it look in the transmission and substations and power plants? On the left is an example of a circuit breaker. It's a 230 kV oil circuit breaker. And so if you could imagine, there's a game I like to play called Mr. Megawatt. Let's follow Mr. Megawatt down the electrical system. And he comes in from the left there, and it's a three-phase system. That's why we have three of those, actually six of those brown bushings. And Mr. Megawatt comes in, goes through those brown bushings on the left side. He goes through contacts in the circuit breaker, and he pops out on the right, and he goes on down the stream to where he's supposed to go. On the right is a 345 kV circuit breaker, an older style, and the same thing. In this case, he comes in on the left and he goes through the interrupters and the contacts in the middle and he pops his way out on the right and carries on down the line. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a 500 kV breaker. This is at one of our stations here in Northern California. And you can see it's a three phase electrical system, and the one on the left. They're all the same circuit breaker, but look at the distance between them. I said earlier, the higher the voltage, the more space you need between the conductors because uh, you don't want them too close because they'll flash over and short out on each other. So that's one circuit breaker. And again, it comes in from the left, goes down through that bushing. The conductor goes through the middle of that bushing, through the bottom of the tank, where there's a bunch of contacts. That's what we call an SF6 breaker. And it pops up and goes out to the right and it heads on down the road. Over on the right is a 230 kV, 230 kV breaker, and you can see it's all in one nice little neat area. Next slide, please. Here's an example of a 69 kV circuit breaker. And then on our distribution system on the right-hand side of the screen is an example of a pole top mounted 138 kV circuit breaker. A lot of the times on the distribution system, they'll put these out on different sections of the line. So as faults occur on the line, they'll just isolate a smaller section of the system. Next slide, please. So here's a typical, typical example of a metal clad switchgear circuit breakers. Inside these cabinets are circuit breakers that will be racked in, racked out, closed. A lot of the times when folks are, are dealing with these things, they're indoors and they require uh, special 
personal protective equipment and face shields when dealing with those because if there's a fault in there they're going to blow out through the door uh, they're a very versatile piece of equipment but they have special challenges when operating next slide please here's an example of uh, the end customer and so on the left is a is a pole mounted pole top mounted transformer and again you can see on the right where the service wires come in and there's our, our weather head and uh, the weather head goes down and ends up in the meter there. Next slide, please. And uh, one thing I want to touch on here before I finish up is some of the interdependencies between the water service, the gas service, and the electric utility. Um, here's an example of just a typical gas meter you'll see on a home in, in uh, actually I think this picture's from Colorado. Uh, and one of the things you need to be aware of as a consumer is if there's a problem on the system, uh, maybe such as an earthquake or something, you need to find out where your gas shutoff is at. And uh, on the right is an example of an uh, underground service to a customer. It's underground. You can see it comes up and it goes right to the meter and I had a discussion with the neighbor there in Colorado. And I said, hey, uh, what if that piece of wire from your meter to the transformer, you know, has a fault or has a problem, it's not the utility's job to replace that, it's the customer, because they kind of stop there at the transformer. And they go, wow, I wish I'd have thought about that before I put all that concrete in. Anyway, next slide, please. All right, that's it for me, uh, pending any questions. Thanks, Pete, appreciate the presentation, excellent. We have a few questions here. Um, uh, first question, can you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, metal clad switch gear, how it differs in function from a circuit breaker or why it's why it's um, why it's different? Yeah, metal clad switch gear a lot of the times are used uh, on the four k v system on on industrial customers and and what it is, it has the substation bus work in there and the circuit breakers and the metering and the protection and so it's a very neat compact way to put a lot of equipment and but it, it, it's more for like industrial type of customers or you'll find those in power plants if power plants have feeders in there and so they have circuit breakers just like those examples of those air circuit breakers we saw in the switch yard it's just it's a way to stuff a lot of equipment in a short compact area and it's insulated uh, to where you can you can do uh, you can have multiple breakers in a small area. Gotcha, great, thank you. Um, can you, or excuse me, can a separate entity own a substation? So I think it's kind of like saying, um, you know, rather than a utility own the substation, could maybe an end user own the substation, or a, a uh, the, third party, yes. I guess. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, someone other than the actual utility could own the substation. Like there's customer substations, and in a lot of cases in in the Midwest area uh, specifically, there'll be substations that we own these three breakers here, circuit breakers here, and the next three uh, circuit breakers are owned and operated by a rural electric cooperative. So there's lines of jurisdiction that we have that we know this is my equipment, this is that equipment, even though we may be in the same substation. So absolutely, that's definitely a possibility. Great. If energy is not sold, how is this balanced in the system? Okay, so I believe the question is, if the energy is not sold, how is the balance in the system? Okay, there's a couple of things going on. If I was to take hydroelectric power plant up at Shasta Dam in Northern California, make adjustments on it and push 100 megawatts out onto the system. Do you guys remember that little a graphic I showed next to the airplane where the green line was going over the red line? I'm gonna see that and my green line is gonna go way above the, the red flat zero line. And I'm gonna see that that there is too much generation on the system and I'm so we call, we call that unscheduled flow in the world every every megawatt that's created has got to be accounted for it's got a source area and it's got a sink area 
and it's all got to balance out and go across those zero lines on those ACE charts for everyone in your interconnected system. And so the trick is we have to track that down and we have to account for it. And it could be, depending if, if we have an excess or deficiency, we're going to have to balance that out. And so uh, the generator operators can't just willy-nilly crank out an additional 100 megawatts. But with that being said, for every amount of gener or a load we have on the system, we have to have generation, they call it uh, operating reserve. And so it's unloaded generation just setting there spinning. So if there's a problem, we can just, the, the governors on the generator will naturally respond and arrest that decay. And then we'll, we'll ramp in a new schedule to replace whatever that loss was. So we have operating reserves on the system, but um, we normally don't create extra energy because energy, how do you create energy? You have to use fuel. And so we don't want to waste fuel. We have requirements and standards set forth by NERC and FERC and local regional councils that say, this is how you got to operate your system. You got to have a certain amount of operating reserve. And uh, we're very aware and careful about our fuel consumption. And we won't consume the fuel to create the power unless we have to. And so for hydro, for us guys at WAPA, it's water. Water's the fuel. Hopefully that answers your question. I know it's kind of long-winded. No problem. Thanks, Pete. We we got quite a few coming in. Um, let me know if you're out of time, um, and then we'll, we'll we'll obviously end. But I'll just keep asking them at least for the time being. Um, can you please compare and contrast a regional transmission approach to a co-locating approach in terms of pros and cons of system design and equipment needs for transmission and distribution of electricity? Okay. So I think Let the question is, I can... I, as I interpret it, it's like regional transmission versus locating generation next to load. Okay. Well, there, there's a couple of things that are that are bouncing around on that one. When I think regional transmission, are you talking like a regional transmission organization, like a California ISO and RTO type of thing? Or are you talking about an engineering design specification where I want to build my generators near my load? So it could go a couple of ways, but let me just, I probably, I don't quite understand or grasp what you're asking me, but let me let me tell you a couple of things. So uh, the big thing that's been around for a couple of years now is distributed generation, and that's solar on top of people's houses. And that's something that, that uh, utilities are, are aware of. I mean, and the renewable resource is excellent, uh, but the trick is they, they, they push back onto the system. And then when the system has trouble or it's a cloudy day, your solar is not working. And so they have to pull off the grid. So there's a fine balance there uh, between distributed generation and how it impacts all utilities. Um, case in point, down in St. Croix, uh, a few years back, they, they offered solar to a lot, of, a lot of customers on the island, which is great. But now the electrical utility meters are not spinning. And so it caused Water and Power Authority of the Virgin Islands to have some financial difficulties because they have those those uh, resources, those generation facilities that they have to still pay for and maintain. And so there's a fine line there on, on distributed generation. And so the, the trick, generally speaking, in the industry is a lot of folks is I don't want transmission lines in my backyard because they're ugly. You know, and as load goes up on the system, you've got to build generation facilities and transmission facilities to get the power to the people. And uh, that's a challenge. And of course, you have the environmental impact. What's that do to the environment? Because, I mean, every, think about how many cell phones we have out there. We have electric cars and things like that. And so the demand will be greater on the electrical system over the, over the next few years. And the challenge is how do we, how do we build that infrastructure to where we can still operate the system electrically and reliably. Thank you. Another question here. What is WAPA doing with tribal renewable energy electrical projects? You know, I don't have an answer to that question. I'm sorry. I, I'm in system operations and I'm sure that uh, I could reach out to some folks at WAPA and, uh, and, and put you in touch with those guys. 
Thank you. An another question. Um, any thoughts on uh, the future of, of, of storage in the electric power system? Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a great question. Any thoughts on electrical storage with the system? And so um, there's something that's been around for quite some time. It's called pump storage generation. We have a system in in uh, Central California, San Luis Reservoir, to where the reservoir is full, and during the day uh, they generate electricity and put it in a four bay, and then at night they flip them around, so to speak, and they pump the water back into the lake. So we keep reusing the same water over and over. Uh, that's one that's not mentioned too much anymore, uh, but it's actually really effective. Now, as far as battery storage and those type of things, you know, if you have a solar farm and then you have battery storage next to it, I don't know if the technology is there to where we could do that. Part of the problem with that type of storage is, I'm going to go deep for just a moment, so I apologize. There's this thing on the electrical system called spinning mass, and that's the generators that are spinning. And when there's deviations on the electrical system, the frequency starts to deviate, and it's the mass of those big hydro units that we use to catch that frequency as it deviates. So if you have gas turbines and those guys, the shafts on those generators are small, lightweight, they spin at, at like 3,600 RPMs or higher, and they can't take that twist and that torque as the frequency uh, deviates on the electrical system. Our hydro units are the guys that can ride through that and kind of help us pull that frequency back a little bit. And so if you throw out a bunch of 50 megawatt gas turbines out there, they don't have any spinning mass behind it. And, and when those problems happen on the electrical system, and trust me, they're happening every day, uh, we need the the strength of the interconnected system in our large generating units, especially hydro, to where we can ride through those those frequencies. And if you start creating all these storage units, and yeah, you may be off peak where you're discharging those storage units, what happens when there's a fault on the system? And I'm sure there's an electrical engineer or two around the world could say, Pete, you're you're I don't know what you're talking about, or you're crazy. And that's okay. But from a real practical system operator, one of the guys that's been responsible since 1986 operating the electrical system, that's something that I, we need to keep in our back pocket and be aware of. I mean, it's a great concept. I'm all for it. Man, I love technology. I love new, new types of things. And, and I'm not the type of guy that says, oh, we've always done it that way. No, let's do some exploring. Let's look at these new things and see how we can operate them. But let's also keep the lights on and let's think about system reliability. And I, I know folks are thinking about that. Hopefully that answered your question. Thanks, Pete. We still got a few more, so just let me know if you have to run. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll take two more. Go ahead. Okay, great. We'll do utilities prefer having wind and solar generation equipment that may be installed on their grids included in their internal monitoring system and control system? So are you asking this? Do we like it? Do you, do you like to have? Um, uh, yeah. Do you like I, to have I mean, monitoring and control sorry. of those of those renewables? Yeah. Yes, most most definitely. If we have a renewable out there, we want to be able to see it and account for it because when the wind stops blowing or the clouds come over, we have to make up for that load that was being served by that generation with traditional generation. So absolutely, without a doubt, we need to see it. Control of it. I don't know, it's, it's it's some other company's asset, but we definitely need to see it and calculate it and account for it and calculate it. Uh, so if and when it does go away, we can replace that energy with some of our traditional generation so we keep the lights on and the system stable. So yes. Great. And then the last one here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about day ahead purchase of power and how that that system is managed? Okay, so uh, day ahead purchase of power. So every day of the year, uh, we are tracking our load patterns. And so we have historical dates. And so when that automatic generation control system operator sets down the chair, he has a load curve that he's looking at. He looks at the weather channel, the weather things. He goes, okay, here's what the weather's gonna be today. Let me go back into history and see what the load cap pattern was for 
Northern California, July 15th, and the temperatures were about the same. He'll look at him over the three or four years, and he looks at his load curve, and he goes, okay. And so he makes adjustment throughout the day in real time to match the load and generation to maintain that balance of 60 cycles. That's how it's handled in real time. When there's shortages, he buys additional power. When there's excess, he'll sell it off. He's got his margins he has to regulate also. So what happens in the day ahead or pre-scheduled world is there's folks doing the same thing. They're looking at all those things and they are taking their best guess on what they think all that criteria is going to add up to and they try to match it to the customer's load requirements and all that's thrown into pre-schedule and then they go out and they try, again, it, it's, it's, there's a science to it and there's a little bit of guessing and they, they make their best guess and then they, they give that load pattern to the generation dispatcher the next day. It rolls over at midnight and he starts looking at what the guess was to, to where how things are actually shaping up. And so a lot of the times we have long-term contracts with certain utilities or certain companies to where we get a certain rate on, on the energy. But what you have to realize too, if it's not our own internal generation, we have to buy transmission to get the power into our system or through our system. And so there's some, some tagging issues that go along with that pre-scheduled and purchase of energy. Hopefully that, that answers your question. Again, if, if there's other questions you guys saw my email, please feel free to, to throw those questions at me at WAPA. And the great thing about WAPA and DOE is we have a great reach back to, to DOE headquarters and folks within Western Air Power Administration that if I can't answer those questions for you, um, I have folks I can put you in touch with that will, will help answer some of your questions. So I, I got time for one more there, James. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me bring them back up here. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, when a system goes down, where does the generator that turns it back, where is the, excuse me, where does the generator that turns it back on if it can't get its energy from the grid? Where does the energy to turn it back on come from? Okay, so I'm sorry, I didn't read it in advance. So yeah, basically, I, under, I, how to, I understand the question. Yeah. Yeah. So the, que the question, if I may summarize, was when the system goes down, we had no voltage and frequency, the system is off. How does the black start generator start if the grid isn't energized? And so how we do that, I'll, I'll do the example of one of our hydro plants here in Northern California. What they have is they, two, they have two 500 kW diesel generators that are tested weekly. And when they lose potential at the power plant, whether it's a system wide outage or if it's just a power plant outages, these guys start on loss of potential. Certain devices open up, these generators automatically, diesel generators automatically start up, they go to 60 cycles and they set there. And then the, the operator, the generator operator goes over, flips a couple of switches, gets the auxiliary circuits energized on the units, and then he goes ahead and goes through the automatic startup process and he starts that generator. And then the generator operator reaches out to the system operator WAPA and says, hey, this is what I'm seeing, what you're seeing, they talk about it, and then what they do is they energize the bus on the station and we talk to our distribution provider and get some load and we kind of go start going down the restoration process. So typically there's backup diesel generators a lot of times that start on loss of potential at the power plant that will start automatically to where we can do uh, black start and system restoration. Great, thanks Pete. So there are a few more questions. I'll just uh, forward those to you um, with with contact information, and and you know when you have the chance, you can you can field those. But we really appreciate your time, Pete. Excellent, excellent information, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, with that, we'll we'll let you go, and 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 we'll move on. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Bye. So our our next presentation is uh, from Tony Jimenez. Ideally, we would have had Tony go first, but due to scheduling constraints, uh, uh, Pete went first. Tony's going to talk a little bit more about energy at a very basic level. So, so that'll be kind of the the most foundational kind of topic. And and uh, um, you know, ideally, would have would have would have Pete's would have built off that, but but this is the way it is. So, um, thanks for your time, Tony, and uh, and your slides are up. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, I'm going to go really, really basic. Uh, the purpose of this presentation really is to 
not going to move ahead here to basically go over fundamental material that is usually assumed that the audience knows in other presentations. Uh, it could also probably be called random topics related to energy basics, um, but I guess energy basics sounds better. Uh, this is what I'm going to cover, uh, energy versus power, common units, forms of energy, work versus heat, three laws of thermodynamics, a little bit on electricity. Uh, Peter gave a great presentation on the whole system, so um, luckily um, I'm going to talk about it really at a really basic level. And then I'm going to end with three slides that kind of show U.S. energy flows and kind of where the U.S. uses, where we get most of our energy or what, what sources produce most of our energy and the, and the energy sectors. Without any further ado, um, first, energy versus power. Uh, this is something that even um, people in the industry tend to uh, sometimes get sloppy in their terminology, uh, so I just want to parse it out and, and have people be really clear what, what the difference is. Um, energy is, is defined as the ability to do work. That's probably not that helpful to you, um, you know, maybe only conceptually. Uh, you consider it, um, if you go back to a physics class, force times distance. So if you're, you know, imagine somebody, you know, a friend sitting on a skateboard and you're pushing them up a hill, um, you know, how hard you're pushing and how long you push them for, that's the amount of energy that you have, you have expended. And finally, energy is a quantity. So it's an amount of, you know, consider an amount of stuff like amount of water in a bathtub or amount of champagne in a champagne glass. Um, it, it's a quantity. So, that, so what's power? Power is the rate at which energy is being created, moved, or used. Uh, so it's energy divided by time. And so you can imagine you know, water coming out of, a, out of a sprinkler or out of a shower head or a liquid being out of a dropper, you know, one being be equivalent more to high power and one being to low power. And again, it's energy divided by time, so it's what I call a rate. And so almost any energy equipment item is going to be rated in terms of its peak power. Um, so example, a 100 kilowatt generator, a five horsepower motor, um, you know, switches and, and whatnot, they'll all be rated to how much, how much peak they can handle before before they break or, or bad things start happening. So again, energy versus power is probably the most fundamental aspect. Energy is a quantity, power is a rate, and power is, is the, um, the rate at which energy is being created, moved, or used. So our units, units of energy, and again, energy is power times time. Um, the most common, SI stands for System International, that's French for International System, i.e. metric. And our standard unit of energy is called the joule, and it's defined as one kilogram. Kilogram is about 2.2 pounds times a meter squared divided by a second squared. So it has units of mass times length squared divided by time squared. Um, we often use the megajoule, which is a million joules, because a joule is a pretty tiny amount of energy. In electrical terminology, we often use the watt hour, or more commonly the kilowatt hour, where a watt hour is 3,600 joules, a kilowatt hour is 3.6 million joules. And I'll explain in a moment how we, how we got those. And then finally, if we're talking heat, uh, because it came from kind of a different time period, in the United States, we still use the British thermal unit or the BTU. And the conversion is one kilowatt hour is equal to about 3,400 BTUs. And a BTU is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Um, so unfortunately, in the U.S., we have all these different kinds of units for energy. Um, typically, use different types of units in different contexts. And if you want to try to do an apples to apples comparison, you often have to do the math and, and suffer the conversion. Um, all right, power, energy divided by time. So our, our metric unit of power is the watt. One watt is one joule per second. Again, a very tiny, tiny quantity, so we'll, or tiny rate. So we often use the kilowatt, which is 1,000 watts. The, the English unit is the BTU per hour, and one kilowatt is 3,400 BTUs per hour. You've also probably heard of the horsepower, especially when you see car commercials. And horsepower is, uh, the conversion is one horsepower is equal to about three quarters of a kilowatt. So how do we get all these, um, especially the kilowatt hour? Where did that come from? Well, we start with our SI unit, our joule. We have our SI unit of power, which is the watt. And then when, the when we started forming electrical systems, 
it just became really handy to say, well, you know, a watt for an hour is a watt hour or a kilowatt for an hour is a kilowatt hour. And that's just a very handy unit of measurement. And so, so they ran with it. So that's kind of, if you follow the steps one, two, three, that's kind of historically why, how those developed. All right. Forms of energy. Broadly speaking, there's, there's um, kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy is basically something in motion, whether it's a cannonball, an artillery shell, um, my military background there, um, somebody, you know, a kid on a, on a skateboard, or all have kinetic energy. Um, also kind of more, you know, more of a stretch is radiant energy. So um, basically light or other electro electromagnetic radiation moving along. It could be sound or it could be electricity in a wire, all forms of kinetic energy. We have potential energy, which is energy that is stored or energy of position. And so, for example, if you take a cannonball and put it up on a shelf, it has potential energy because it could fall off the shelf. It will move faster and faster until it hits the ground, and, you know, and, and there will be energy from that position. Uh, mechanical energy, you could stretch a spring, and there will be energy in the spring, depending on how much you stretch it. You could have nuclear energy. Um, this is where we kind of expand our, you know, energy is conserved to matter energy is conserved. And um, in a nu nuclear power plant, if you split apart a large atom, the, the resulting small atoms don't weigh quite as much. The sum of their weights isn't quite as much as, as the big atom, and the difference is converted to energy. And finally, gravitational energy. So if you think of water falling down a spillway and running a generator, that's gravitational energy and energy of position. So again, we have kinetic energy, which is something in motion, and poten potential energy, which is you know, something high up because it could fall or a spring that's stretched or, or some such thing like that. The other uh, thing I want to discuss is work versus heat. They're both forms of energy, and, and you may say, well, duh. Uh, but actually, that was only figured out about 200, 250 years ago and, and represents a really big advance in, in physics and science. And the difference is work can be thought of as organized energy. So if you think of a shaft moving or, you know, some objects be moving along, that's organized energy or a spinning shaft or electricity in a wire, all organized energy. You can think of heat can be thought of as disorganized energy. And so why do we care? Why am I, why am I flogging this dead horse? Um, the reason is, is there's a big efficiency heat hit when you go from heat to work. You can imagine if you have a mob of people and you're trying to get them to all do something, the effort required to, to get them all moving in the right direction is a, you know, kind of an analogy. Same thing going from heat to work is you have to do a lot of engineering and, and go through a lot of hoops to do that, and you lose a lot of it. So typically, uh, when you're going from heat to work, you're going to lose you know, two thirds, 80%, 90% of the energy, um, you know, de uh, depending on, on how efficient your system is. Whereas if you go from work to heat or from fr one form of work to another, typically the losses are, you know, might only be a few percent or, or less. Um, and so examples would be the transmission in your car where it moves the, the high speed shaft from your engine to the low speed shaft needed to drive your wheels. That's, that's a form of converting work, uh, you know, work from one form to another, it's kind of the same thing, but you're, you, know, you don't lose that much going through your transmission. Whereas if you're burning coal to create electricity, you lose a lot of the energy embedded in the coal. Uh, only a small portion of that comes out as electricity on the other end. So work versus heat. I've given you probably a lot of pie in the sky stuff, so maybe some examples to help with your intuition. So think of your typical hair dryer. Um, I looked at the ones that I had as a kid or my sister had when I was a kid. Um, you know, I haven't had hair that I've needed to blow dry in, in almost 40 years now. Um, but, you know, you typically 1,000 to 1,500 watts or one to one and a half kilowatts. That's the amount of, of, of power consumed by a hair dryer. Average U.S. single family home, the average load is about a kilowatt. Obviously, it's a lot more during the day and, you know, maybe close to zero at night. So if we look at our monthly consumption, you're looking at maybe six, 600 to 1,000 kilowatt hours per month consumed by your average single family house. Output of a large power plant on the order of 1,000 megawatts. You know, some are maybe two or 3,000 megawatts depending. 
Um, but that's, that's kind of a, you know, you think a large power plant, think about 1,000 megawatts. Finally, total U.S. energy consumption, and I'll, I'll touch on this uh, towards the end of my presentation, 97 quadrillion BTUs, or tw that's uh, 97 followed by 15 zeros, uh, or 28 trillion kilowatt hours, or 97 quads, where a quad is a quadrillion BTUs. And that's, that's total electrical consumption, total heat, total, total everything. Some other, um, this is more on fuel sources and how much energy is embedded in, in, in different fuels. So coal, you know, we have, depending on the type of coal, anywhere from 2,400 to, I'm sorry, 24 to 34 megajoules per kilogram. Again, a kilogram is 2.2 pounds, and a megajoule is a million joules. And especially, you're wondering where you see joules often in this, this type of thing where it's the energy in, in fuel sources. So about six to 10 kilowatt hours thermal, I put the TH there to show that you're not gonna get that much electricity out of it, but if you, you know, electricity and heat, that's much, how much you get. Natural gas, about 50 megajoules per kilogram, about 15 kilowatt hours thermal per kilogram. Diesel fuel, a little less. Dry wood, a lot less. You're talking about 18 megajoules per kilogram, maybe five kilowatt hours thermal per kilogram. And then looking at some of the renewable energy resources, in the U.S., average global insulation within the, the continental United States, that's basically the amount of sunlight hitting the ground, you're looking at about three to six kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. Meter squared is about 10 square feet. Um, wind power density, so the energy of the air moving across the landscape, looking at anywhere from uh, under 20 watts per meter squared to over 600, where the majority of that is under, I'd say, 250. Uh, the wind farms are mostly in the in the areas that have more than about 300. So you could say for taking that that wind, for example, let's say you had 100 watts per meter squared. There is about 9,000 hours per year. So if you do the math, you, there'd be about 900. I'm sorry, about 90 kilowatt hours per year um, through that square meter through that notional square meter. Um, so this is a way to to help you. Um, kind of do back in the envelope calculations. Kind of some other terms and conversion factors that, that are really handy. A year is 8760 hours and a non-leap year. A 30-day month has 720 hours and one hour has 3600 seconds. So kind of useful things to know when you're when you're trying to do conversions. Other other item you often hear about in energy is capacity factor. What that is is actual energy production over some time frame, typically a year or longer divided by the possible energy production if that facility produced at rated power over the whole that time frame. Um, nothing ever produces at 100% capacity factor. Um, some you know, might be 80, 90% uh, base load, say coal plant or nuclear plant. It's on most of the time and it's at, at, ear, at or near rated power most of the time. Renewable energy facilities might be on the order of 25 or, or, or 40% depending if it's PV or wind. And that's a lot of times because sometimes the wind's not blowing, sometimes the sun's not shining, and also sometimes the, re um, the resource may be at, uh, just enough to run that facility at partial load rather than, than at full rated power. Um, but it's a useful term. You see it a lot, uh, uh, especially in doing financial analysis or, or kind of high-level analysis um, is the capacity factor of, of a given facility. All right, I'm going to summarize the, the laws of thermodynamics for, for non-technical people. Um, you'll see a lot of um, some, um, um, some analogies to going to Vegas. I guess I'll say it that way. One, you can't get more energy out than you put in, i.e. you can't win. Um, so you can send the perpetual motion machine people away if they, if they come to your door. Second law basically says that every time you convert energy from one form to another, you lose a little bit. Um, so you can't, you can't even break even. And the third law is a bit technical, but basically it comes down to you can't quit the game. So even if you're sitting here staring at the screen, you, you know, your body is doing processes that are, that are limited by the three laws of thermodynamics. Your computer is being run by processes that are limited by the, by the laws of thermodynamics. So this is, this is happening all the time. But the first two are the really more, most important one. You know, it's accounting. You can't, you're not going to get more energy out into a system than you put in. And there's always losses every time you convert from one to another. I'm going to talk very, very briefly at the, at the very basics of, of electricity. So this is what's going on kind of physically in, in, in this big network 
that uh, Peter described. I'm going to talk about three things, charge, current, and voltage. Um, so the definition of charge, it's actually not very, very intuitive. If you look at note one, it says the physical property of matter that causes it to experience a force when placed in an electromagnetic field. It's probably not in helpful that much, but I think most of us have some sort of intuitive sense of what charge is. There's plus charge and minus charge, and if like charges repel and um, the opposite charges attract. Our SI unit of charge is the Coulomb, and a Coulomb is 6.2 times 10 to the 15th. The charge in 6.2 times 10 to the 15th electrons or protons. Um, where an electron or a proton has the fundamental unit of charge, you can't you can't have a smaller unit than that. Um, current is and you can and charge like energy, you can think of it as a quantity. All right. Current, charge times time. So that's charge moving along, say, a, a power line, a power line. It's analogous to flow in a pipe. Uh, the, our SI unit is the amp for the ampere, and it's defined as coulombs per second. So if you have one amp moving in a wire, you have six, you know, 6.2 times 10 to the 15 charge carriers moving past that point every second. And finally, voltage, um, which is you can kind of think of as pressure in a pipe is the energy per unit charge. So if something's high voltage, those charges have a lot of energy. And if it's low voltage, they have not very much energy. And the, the SI definition is the joule per coulomb, and the SI unit is the volt. And I'll uh, point you to the last note on the slide um, for the footnotes. That electric current is given by, is current times voltage. And if you do the math, you get joules per second, which is the units of power. So current times voltage gives you power, and that tells you how much power is, is, is flowing through the power line. The only other thing I'm going to talk about um, electricity is AC versus DC, and basically direct current, all the charge carriers are moving in the same direction all the time, and an alternating current, they're moving back and forth. And so this is kind of where our analogy with water breaks down a little bit, because if the water molecules in your pipe move back and forth all the time, you would never be able to fill your bathtub. Uh, and electricity, even though they're moving back and forth, we can still get the energy out of them and, and life is good and your, your TV runs and your lights turn on and, and life is good. Um, looking at the figure below, if you kind of graph voltage and, and current over time, um, in a direct current, they're, they're not say constant, but they're always above zero um, and they're just constant over time. Whereas an alternating current, you can see they go back and forth crossing the zero line each time. And that's that's basically the difference. Why do we have alternating current? It sounds more complicated, mainly because it's easier to move electricity more than a short distance with alternating current than with direct current. Um, so it's the engineering realities um, pushed us in that direction. And that's all I'm going to say about electricity. Um, there's certainly a lot more that could be said. Okay, three more, three more slides. Um, energy sources. So this is and this is a great chart from the the website of the the energy. The EIA, the Energy Information Administration, this is U.S. energy consumption by energy source. So this is everything, like the, the power, the energy we use to make electricity, the energy we use to run our cars, the energy we use to heat, everything. And so you can see it's the, the, there's basically six elements of that pie chart. Uh, the biggest single source was petroleum. Uh, next, followed by natural gas. Coal gave us 14%. Nuclear power gave us 9%. And renewable energy gave us 11%. And then the pi the, the pi segment representing renewable energy is then further broken down um, into hydroelectric, wind, uh, solar, geothermal, and and the various biomasses. So you can see we get most the vast majority of our energy by you know if you add up the petroleum, the natural gas, the coal, and you know the biomass by burning stuff. And so going back to that slide, heat versus work, um, you know that means we're losing a lot of a lot of energy because um, because just because of, of losses that cannot be overcome. So those are our main energy sources as of 2017. This next slide kind of shows the, the energy flows from our sources to the sectors. Uh, this shows four sectors. There's transportation, industrial, residential, commercial, and electric power. And you can see kind of where the sources go. So, for example, about three quarters of petroleum is used in the transportation sector to drive cars, trucks, um, trains, boats, whatever. 
Um, a most of the rest is using the industrial sector. Natural gas um, is split um, between industrial, residential, commercial, and electric power, and then just a tiny bit in transportation. And you can see how the rest goes. Um, but you can see we have our sources on the left, petroleum, natural gas, coal, renewable energy, and nuclear. And then the sectors, which define how they're used on the right. Next slide is going to expand on this a, a little bit more. And I personally love this chart. I saw this, a version of this back in 1990 when I was a college student in a, I think in an issue of Scientific American, and I loved it because it just tells, has so much information in it. Um, a few changes from the previous slide. One thing that, that this, this slide makes clear is that electricity, you know, we call it the electric sector, but it's not really an end use. We don't make electricity just for the sake of making electricity. We make electricity because it's a really useful form of electricity, but then it's, it's used in the other sectors, mostly residential, commercial, and industrial at this point in time. You can see just a tiny bit going to transportation, but we expect that uh, that's going to change dramatically over in the coming years as we get more and more electric vehicles coming along. And you can see the size, you know, the fatness of the, 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 different, the different arrows and flows kind of shows the relative size of those, of those flows. Um, the other thing, this is, this is different, is this actually splits residential and commercial into separate sectors. Um, and finally, the last thing, the light gray, is you can see what's called rejected energy. And so those are the losses. So you can see of this, you know, almost 100 quads of energy that we use, we only really got about 30 quads of useful service out of it, and the rest was lost. Um, and some of that reflects fundamental uh, limits on converting heat to work, and some of it is the fact that uh, some of our stuff is not as efficient as it could be. And so you can see electric generation, which usually involves burning something to make electricity, the, you know, we lose two-thirds of the incoming energy. Uh, the residential and commercial sectors are a little bit more efficient overall, and again, the, transport, the, the transportation sectors also has a lot of losses because you're converting, again, you're burning fuel and you're converting it into motion, mechanical motion. And so you have some hard thermodynamic limits, which we don't even come close to approaching. But you can see a, you know, a large proportion of that energy is lost. Uh, and so a lot of losses. Uh, and so we can, um, I, I guess this make, makes the pitch for energy efficiency to, to reduce those as much as possible. Um, so that kind of concludes my presentation. Uh, a few resources and links here, and I guess I'll be taking questions after Travis gives his, his presentation. Thanks, Tony. The excellent presentation. A challenging, challenging topic to cover all, all of that, but uh, uh, yeah, some interesting stuff there and valuable slides. Hopefully, uh, people will keep these slides available and, and reference them in the future. Um, so, uh, uh, so Tony talked about the basics of, of energy, and then Pete earlier talked about you know how the electric grid works. Now we're going to go on to Travis's presentation, who's going to kind of help us up better understand how we can utilize energy projects on on, on you know tribal lands or, or within tribal communities to to actually um, uh, you know help out tribes in, a, in an economic manner. So, uh, kind of the the last building block is, is, is this presentation, which is uh, financial energy, financing energy projects um, uh, on tribal land. So with that, uh, Travis, jump jump on in. All right. Uh, thank you, James. Um, can you all see my screen? Is this, we're all set to go? Great. Okay. So uh, thanks, everyone, for your time today. Um, my presentation is decidedly a little less technical than the uh, the, the two excellent preceding presentations that we've had. Um, but uh, I'm going to keep it basic as the other two did. It's sort of the same of today's webinar and uh, really just run through some high level considerations and concepts involved in financing energy projects on tribal lands. And there we go, great. So here's the agenda, very quick. Uh, we're gonna discuss tribal roles vis-a-vis -vis energy projects. Uh, what role uh, the tribe can play and, and what the benefits could be um, attached to each of those roles. And then we'll go through some sources of capital and then we'll talk about ownership structures. Um, as an initial matter, I just wanted to go through uh, or, or bring this in up front. Um, when we talk about financing projects, there's really three phases, three major phases uh, that you are, um, is this all showing on everyone's no. screen? Okay, just wanna make sure that 
<laughs> people can see clearly. Um, so uh, the three major phases that you will be uh, paying for, the, the reason that you will be sourcing financing, uh, it begins with feasibility. That's sort of like the techno-economic analysis you do to determine, uh, you know, what, what are your resources? What kind of project you want to do? Uh, what's the business case? What do the economics look like? Um, and then once you sort of uh, have identified what kind of technology you'll be working with, uh, size of project, and then the, um, the business case for it, you go into the site or the development pre-construction phase where you get site control um, on, on tribal lands that may not be such a, a, a difficult matter as it is um, for uh, private companies operating, uh, you know, uh, with an ownership structure uh, outside there um, uh, on private lands. But uh, you also work with uh, permitting processes. You go to uh, AHJs and um, and determine, uh, you know, what kind of permits you'll need and what, uh, what regulations you need to follow. Uh, you'll do some equipment procurement at this phase or at least sort of investigate what vendors you're going to be working with. And then uh, this phase generally encompasses uh, the period when you will close on your financing um, before you go to construction, uh, at which phase uh, you uh, typically will uh, take out a construction loan. This is a high cost, high risk phase. So uh, putting capital at risk is usually something you, you might want to uh, outsource to a third party. The operations phase, which I don't mention here, uh, if your project is sound, um, hopefully it is, uh, the idea is that um, uh, operations will pay for uh, the costs of the, um, of the system. So uh, these three phases I've got right here, that's your, that's your CapEx, all leading up to uh, capital expenditure. And then uh, once you tip over into operations, you go into your operating expenditures, your OPEX, and those are paid for with operating revenues. So um, we'll launch right into tribal roles. Uh, before we get into the actual roles a, a tribe may play in an energy project, um, you want to ask some basic questions first. Um, and these will sort of result from your feasibility study. But uh, what's the technology you're working with? Are you working with, is it just going to be a gas plant, solar plant, wind farm, biomass? Um, what's the size of the project? Uh, is this going to be distributed such that you are going to be offsetting facility level or, or regional or a district level uh, load? Or, or is this going to be utility scale such that you're going to be selling the energy um, to an off taker, uh, a utility or, uh, or some such entity? And um, what's the goal of the tribe? Is this going to be uh, you trying to generate savings from um, offset of local load? Or is this a business opportunity? Are you selling the energy? Is this a revenue generation opportunity? Um, before you even get into the types of financing uh, that you're going to need and where you're going to source it from, uh, these are the basic questions you want to ask. Um, and you also uh, want to know what role the tribe is going to play um, in relation to the project. So uh, here we've got a graphic that shows your basic classic risk re reward uh, correlation. And uh, that is not accidentally also correlated with how much money you're willing to uh, put into the endeavor. So at the top here, we've got developer owner. Um, that's the role that where you basically do all the work to um, investigate the project, secure the site, get the permitting done, and advance the project to the phase where you can uh, begin construction. Um, you can be an equity investor, so take a little less of an active role um, as a developer where you're doing all the work to get to the project to construction phase. Um, you're more just putting up the money uh, and uh, being promised to return uh, if certain conditions are met and the project operates as uh, forecasted. Uh, you can be a lender, which uh, is a little lower risk than an equity investor. I'll talk about that a little later. Um, basically loan the money project or uh, loan the project money and earn an interest rate off of that and, and uh, reap regular payments. Um, Typically, because that's lower risk, your return is not as high as an equity investor or even as a developer owner. Um, and then uh, moving on to the less capital intensive roles, um, the tribe can uh, act as an off taker, uh, in other words, an energy purchaser. Um, and usually uh, that's through a uh, power purchase agreement. And uh, there's got to be usually some stipulation for the power purchase agreement to make economic sense. There will be a stipulation that the energy purchased from the uh, system will be less than what the tribe is purchasing from the utility or uh, whatever entity it currently procures its energy from. Um, as a landowner, the tribe can also uh, lease its land 
um, or for, to the system and uh, for, in some cases earn royalties if there's an extraction um, operation going on there. And then finally, own M subcontractor, which basically means you operate the system uh, for a uh, fee for payments. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of this slide, uh, but there are various business structures that the tribe will want to consider um, based on what role it is playing. Uh, but the primary considerations uh, you'll want to investigate up front are uh, what are the capital requirements, what are the return requirements, uh, what's the tribe's risk tolerance, um, and if it's uh, something that they'd like to sort of seal off, ring fence in a, in a uh, incorporated entity like an LLC, um, what uh, kind of protection does the tribe want for its assets? Um, again, uh, ring fencing through an LLC. Um, or a, um, some other type of incorporated entity uh, can uh, protect the tribal assets. Um, usually that comes with a waiver of sovereign, uh, sovereign immunity, though, so the LLC does not have access to uh, sovereign immunity, which in some cases can be challenging for tribes. Um, preserving tribal sovereignty, that gets to that um, sort of outcome. Uh, minimizing liability and facilitating construction. These are all things that uh, the business structure uh, will, inf or, or the, these are all considerations that will inform the business structure um, in addition to what role the tribe can play. So moving on to the sources of capital that you, uh, the tribe would investigate um, once it has decided on what kind of business structure and what kind of project it's going to do. Uh, generally, when we talk about energy project finance, there's really two general buckets of capital that you're working with um, debt or ownership, to coin a phrase or a term, and equity or ownership. And so uh, within those two broad categories, debt being you borrow money to build uh, and, uh, and perhaps own the facility, equity is you do own the facility. Um, that's money you put up um, as a tribe coming from your own uh, reserves, et cetera. But uh, given these two buckets, there are a few different flavors of uh, capital that um, could uh, contribute to either one of those buckets. So uh, cash on hand uh, from the tribe, that's generally what uh, we would uh, throw into the equity bucket. Uh, debt, I um, want to just sort of enumerate that there's lots of different types of debt there, um, and I've got a slide coming up here which will go into some more detail about the specific types of um, of all these uh, uh, sources that I'm listing here. Grants, uh, there are a number of grant opportunities. Usually uh, that will come, um, or it, it can come with some sort of um, skin in the game, uh, some sort of cost sharing requirement. Um, but generally grants uh, we would count as equity and then the, uh, the cost share would also be um, in-kind contributions uh, that you can put up to that. Um, incentives can also be uh, leveraged. Um, usually they can Incentives are complicated because they can sort of fall into any one of these uh, categories of uh, debt or equity. Um, and uh, sometimes they will be investment based, in which case they might be equity. Sometimes they'll be production based, which would be um, uh, fall into the operating uh, or, uh, operating revenues category. Um, guaranteed savings contracts, that would be a contractual mechanism such as an ESPC uh, where you are uh, lever or earning savings um, on your operating revenues, and that allows you to um, cover the cost of, of a project or cover the cost of investment in a project. And then operating revenues um, or, or savings, that's if you are offsetting uh, electricity uh, use at a facility, that would be the savings side of that. Um, and operating revenues would be the uh, what you earn from selling the electricity if it's a, uh, a revenue-generating project. Um, Here's a breakout of various examples. I won't go through each of these. I sort of did that on the last slide. But as these slides will be available um, after this presentation, uh, this is available for your reference. And again, these are just uh, skimming the surface for some of these. Um, obviously, in the loans category debt, you are, uh, you're working with all kinds of flavors of, um, of capital sources. Uh, this next slide, real quick, uh, on the incentive side, these are the incentives available to renewable energy projects specifically. Obviously, incentives in oil and gas, you've got uh, your, um, your 
offsets for uh, dry well drilling and, and uh, uh, drilling costs. But uh, these are available uh, from the federal government. PTC, the production, ta production tax credit uh, may use for wind and other technologies, ITC solar and other technologies. They uh, operate um, fundamentally differently and um, it is of note that they can be difficult for tribes to access uh, because um, tribes are not federally uh, tax paying entities. So uh, I mentioned them here just because they are extremely important to renewable energy finance in particular. Um, and uh, I've got some definitions at the end of this presentation uh, for reference. In the process of securing debt, I wanted to highlight that it's a it can be a thorough process uh, and and generally pretty difficult to meet some of the requirements of lenders and, and achieve an interest rate that uh, makes sense for the project economics. Um, the lender will typically go through a process called due diligence, where they will investigate everything from who's borrowing, uh, what's it for, what's the collateral you're going to put up on a project. Um, usually in project we call debt uh, at the project level non-recourse, which means that um, the lender has recourse to the assets but not the balance sheet. They do not have recourse, in other words, to the balance sheet of the borrower. Um, that would be recourse uh, debt um, if they do have access, but typically in a project finance situation and what makes project finance a successful um, arrangement for um, building infrastructure. Uh, such as energy projects, is that the lenders don't have access to um, the borrower. They only have access to the um, liquidation value of the assets or the or the revenue generation value of the assets, such that if there's a default, some sort of breach of the loan contract, then um, they can only go to the assets to recover their, their capital. Um, but because they are in a position where they have to uh, put themselves at risk, they want to make sure that the partner they're working with is sound. They want to make sure that the project is sound. And so uh, they will generally make borrowers uh, do their work to prove that this is uh, the right investment for the debt provider. Um, and this is just a high level list of criteria right here to give you a sense of what you'd be working with um, when seeking lender capital. Uh, now we've talked about the various types of capital sources, roles that the tribe can play. We'll sort of mash them together and we'll talk about ownership structures. Uh, the first one going into it, direct ownership is the simplest structure you can work with. The tribe uh, would own the project outright. They may uh, on the back end have some debt that they're doing it with, but the debt is not at the project level. So the, uh, the cash flow is pretty clean. The tribe either, um, well, I should, I should mention that because the tribe would need to put up all the capital for this project, generally this might be a smaller scale project uh, because the larger scale projects can be quite costly um, and sometimes you will need uh, leverage or debt uh, and an equity investor to, to drive those to the finish line. But um, in this case, let's call this a, uh, you'll see in the top left corner there, community or facility scale, right? So it serves a, a cluster of buildings or it serves one building. Um, and it was small enough that uh, the tribe had enough capital on hand to purchase the system. So they're using the system to offset energy purchases uh, from the utility. That offset uh, comes at a discount. So they generate um, energy at a cost that is uh, less than what they pay the utility. They're earning savings on that. Um, and that's their operating uh, revenues, essentially, um, is, is the savings they're getting there. Um, and it's all very clean. The, uh, the tribe owns the project, and um, they make their payments to the utility, and uh, it's more or less business as usual with uh, you've got an offsetting um, generator there on site. It gets a little more complicated with debt because you've the, uh, the lender is going to trap cash, um, which means that they're going to uh, get their payments, uh, which include principal, which is the original loan amount and interest at regular intervals specified in the, um, the, debent the debenture or the, the um, debt contract. And um, so the uh, tribe in this case, uh, owning the project, but having uh, debt at the project level uh, is earning less of those savings. So uh, previously where they may have uh, been getting um, a dollar of savings, uh, on every uh, kilowatt hour they purchase. That's not a real world example. That's a very high amount and 
most times kilowatt hours don't even get up to the dollar level, but let's say they earn a dollar for every kilowatt hour um, in savings that they avoid from purchasing a utility, uh, debt might take 50% of that dollar or 50 cents on that dollar or more as the case may be, depending on how the, uh, the debt agreement is and how the project actually operates in the field. Um, I'll jump right uh, or, or to PPA purchase or PPAs quickly. So a power purchase agreement stipulates that the tribe does not own the project. The project is owned by a third party. That's that box you see on the right there, developer and financial partner. Um, but the tribe uh, can host that system. It doesn't have to, but um, commonly that's what happens. And you've got a, uh, a system generating energy on site um, that's owned by a third party, and the tribe purchases the energy from that system. So instead of owning it and earning those savings um, um, that they would get from uh, having the project themselves, they get a dollar per kilowatt hour agreed upon price for energy from the system. And generally, um, that should be lower than what they pay the utility on an average basis so they can realize savings from that contract. PPAs generally are something that people execute when they are looking for um, uh, economic returns. The issue here is that because a third party owns the system, generally that third party, um, it's got its own financial structure and it's got its own return requirements. So uh, it's often challenging for them to offer um, a tribe the same uh, economics they could get were the tribe to own the system uh, itself. So real quickly, uh, Advantages and disadvantages of some PPA or of PPAs. Uh, PPAs do not require any upfront costs, so there's no capital expenditure generally. Uh, you're only paying for the energy, uh, so it's an advantageous situation if the tribe is limited uh, on uh, with capital and uh, wants to recognize savings on day one. PPAs can be one way to do that. Um, because you don't own the system, there's no operations and maintenance. Um, for some systems, uh, you can still benefit from the tax incentives federal tax incentives, so if the tribe can't access those because it doesn't have a federal income tax liability, it can still benefit from federal taxes. Um, a locked-in energy price, generally a PPA is an agreement for energy purchased on year or day one, and in some cases they include an escalator, some cases they'll include a floater, but generally it's all spelled out in the contract and it's easy for the tribe to sort of track what its liability for payments would be over the course of a, of a contract, 20 years, generally what you see for PPAs in the market. And in some cases, the PPA can allow a path to ownership. So um, if the tribe doesn't have the resources to own the system on day one, it can pay for the energy. And over time, it can build up some capital and purchase the system outright at some later date. Uh, generally, uh, with renewable energy projects that have tax incentives uh, attached to them, that has to be after the tax incentives are exhausted. Uh, so um, after year six or after year five of project operations in year six. Um, some disadvantages are that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you don't get uh, the best deal because you have to pay for somebody else's financial structure and returns. So it may not beat your current electricity rates. Um, can be difficult for small projects because you're not achieving those economies of scale. Um, transaction costs can be higher, uh, which you would pay for through your, uh, your energy rate, but transaction costs can also be high if you've got uh, your own project. Uh, so that may or may not be the case. Um, and uh, in a lot of cases, you don't have ownership of the recs, which means that you can't be claiming to, claiming to generate clean energy because you're selling those environmental attributes when you have a PPA. Generally, the PPA provider will uh, retain ownership of the recs to make the system more economic unless the uh, off-taker or the energy purchaser in the PPA wants to hold on to those recs bad enough that they are willing to forego the economic advantage that those can be. Uh, that those can provide. Um, RECs uh, generally only come from um, uh, certain types of systems. We're talking renewable energy here, or um, in some cases, nuclear energy has got uh, uh, a uh, environmental credit or some kind of uh, low emissions credit attached to them as well in some jurisdictions. So that's PPA. Tribe does not own the, tr the project. Um, if the tribe does want to own a project, it's a larger project and they need heavier investment, they might seek an investor um, to participate uh, on top of a lender. And so uh, this chart demonstrates 
a tax equity arrangement, which is uh, sort of a, um, a, a animal you see when there's tax advantage financing, could be renewable energy projects, could be historic rehabilitation, um, could be low income housing, uh, but uh, generally you work with a structure such that a third party can come in and take advantage of those tax credits. Um, doesn't have to be a tax advantage structure. It could be um, you're just looking for a, a secondary equity investor because that person brings money uh, that can uh, really pump up the, um, the ability of the project to, to build out a larger system, uh, which makes the most economic sense, both from an economy as a scale standpoint, uh, but also um, if it's a revenue generating project, you obviously want to generate as much revenue as possible. Uh, so in this structure, you've got your, your project entity in the middle there. That's generally an LLC, uh, some kind of shell corporation. And uh, down at the bottom right, uh, project developer, that uh, might be the role of the tribe. Um, also, let's say that uh, the tribe uh, has an ownership stake. So as a developer owner, uh, the tribe is participating um, and investing in the project. The uh, investor, the third party investor comes in at the left. If there's a tax credit situation, um, the, tax, the, tax, the investor will usually get those tax credits um, and there'll be some kind of flip mechanism. I won't go into that here. Um, but that's generally how a partnership flip works and, and uh, tax advantage structures. Um, the utility um, or the off taker of the uh, project gets the electricity, the debt uh, or, uh, lend or the uh, debt provider or lender gets its debt payments and interest. And then uh, the resource owner or the, or the land provider, in this case, imagined to be the tribe, uh, if, uh, might earn a royalty payment or a or a rental payment off of the um, the what they provide for the project to be cited. Um, generally, when the tribe owns or has an equity stake in the project, uh, there may not be a, a lease payment for the land, just because that's another project cost or uh, operating cost that has to be accounted for, and generally will drive up the price of energy. So to make the project competitive, you might want to balance the interests of earning a lease rates on the land versus trying to get the lowest cost uh, energy such that you could um, be competitive in the marketplace. Um, generally, when you're working with a third party investor uh, or any other investor in the project, you've got what's called a waterfall structure. And so when money comes into the project through those energy sales, you've got your reserve account up top. This is, this is a, a generalized version. So uh, waterfalls will differ project to project depending on who's involved and and what's required in the various contracts of the, the project financial structure. But um, in this example, you've got a reserve account up front, and then you've got a uh, operating account. And once the money goes into that operating account, it gets dispersed to uh, the various parties. You've got the debt payments. Notice that is ahead of any of the equity payments. Um, uh, the debt service account uh, generally is a same piece of that, the, the, where you the pay the debt holder. Um, and then you've got your reserve accounts, that'll go to subordinated debt. And then the distribution accounts at the very bottom is where your equity comes in. Those distribution accounts um, are subordinated, or what we say, to the uh, debt holders, because um, the debt, as I mentioned very early in this presentation, uh, is a lower risk with the stipulation that they get paid first in the case of not only the waterfall, but if there is a default of the project, breach of contract somehow, um, then the uh, debt provider is going to get its pound of flesh before any of the other parties are going to get their uh, equity distributions. Uh, so this distribution account at the bottom, uh, generally what happens is if you've got a third party investor, the third party investor may trap most of that um, to uh, earn its return um, in its stipulated amount of time. A lot of times on renewable energy projects in particular, you'll see the, uh, the tax equity uh, needs to earn its return in um, five years or so. Um, and so they will uh, take as much cash as is required to do that. And then what's left over goes to the um, what's called the sponsor equity, which is the developer owner we saw in that previous uh, slide there. And so the developer owner is long-term owner generally. Um, they're in it for the long haul. Um, particularly as if, if it's the tribe and it's on their land, um, they're going to own the project and they're going to earn long-term revenue. So it's a bit of a longer-term play for them. 
Um, there is also the option for the long-term owner to sell um, and earn some revenues right up front um, in any given year of the project. But generally, the easiest way to sell is when all the financing is paid off um, from the debt or, uh, and or the, uh, the third-party equity provider. So that is just some very high-level concepts. Um, any one of those slides, um, as is the case of my colleagues on today's presentation, could have could have spent a number of uh, uh, presentations just going through. But um, I've got some definitions and some uh, resources at the end of my presentation. Um, please make use of them. Uh, my email is also in the presentation. Uh, please uh, send me any questions. And uh, I want to thank you again for your time today. Thanks, Travis. Appreciate your time as well. Excellent presentation. Um, you know, a very broad subject again, and, and you did a good job covering it at a, at a high level. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions, uh, just a couple of those, so, and we have a few more minutes. So uh, feel free as an audience to continue to submit written questions, and, and we, we hope, I expect we'll be able to get to them. Um, first off, a question for uh, Travis. On the waterfall there, uh, you listed a cash sweep to lenders after the the, the debt payments. Um, can you describe what that what that is? Yes. So uh, the, the cash sweep generally just means that uh, the there's a principal and an interest amount you have to pay, and on top of that, there's something called a debt service coverage ratio, which is an amount of money you need on hand to make sure you can cover more than just your basic debt service. Usually debt service coverage ratios is expressed as a, as a uh, decimal number. So it'll be like 1.3 or something like that. So not only do you need your, uh, your debt service, which is your one, but you need your 0.3 more than your debt service to be sure that you have enough in reserve um, in the case that the project uh, doesn't generate enough revenue at any given time period, or there's some other issue um, where the project's earning not, uh, not earning enough, um, you have that debt service on hand to be able to uh, meet loan payments um, for a period out or more than one period out. Um, so when I talk about a sweep, whatever cash is coming in, that gets uh, picked up, whatever you need to service your principal and interest and your debt service coverage ratio, and then whatever cash is left over flows on down that waterfall. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I guess just an overview. So we, we've received a lot of questions about getting access to the slides. Um, uh, uh, shortly, we'll, we'll show the, the last slide here again that has the link uh, to, to where the slides will be posted. Uh, however, the slides won't be posted uh, immediately. Um, so it'll take us a little bit of time to get the slides up on, on the web page. So I, I recommend you check back in and, and uh, that link there at the bottom of the page you'll be able to access the slides there but maybe not for for a few days certainly in a week if you check back they should be posted and at that time we also have a, a recording of this webinar posted there so you can rewatch the, the the whole the whole thing um and and i guess to wrap that up what you also should receive an email uh uh in the next day or so from from go to webinar that will have that same link in, in the email uh, so with that, a uh, question here for Tony. Um, going back to that uh, interesting slide on, on how energy is used in the United States and, and where it goes. Um, in the rejected energy total, the light gray, how much of that is actually generated electricity that is not matched with load as opposed to energy conservation and efficiencies, et cetera? So um, all right. If I, slide up. Yeah, probably be helpful. Um, I don't think hardly any of it is a is a mismatch between electricity generation and load because they work very hard to to match it. So there, it's not like um, you know, hardly there's, there's hardly ever any any electricity that's generated that, that's not used used somewhere. You, what'll happen is you'll see the the frequency might go up a little bit and then they'll they'll turn something down a little bit and, and get it back on. Get it back to match. So, it, it, it's not, practically none. I, I guess is is, is a short answer. Um, what you see out of there is the energy and the various inputs 
that was not converted to electricity if you see you know, the, the gray coming out of out of the electricity generation. That's what that is. It, it's basically um, incoming energy that was not converted into electricity, but generally heat that went up went out the stack, essentially. Great. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think that answers it. Um, yeah, so the various thermal generation sources are relatively inefficient, and so um, a lot of it is just waste heat at the end. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, let's see. So I, I believe that's all of the, let's see. Yeah, I don't see any new questions on these topics. Um, so we'll give it a moment to, to to wrap up here, but you know, submit it, and we might be able to grab it just before we end. Um, yeah. So with, so with that, once again, I want to thank everybody um, for their time today, both as an audience and as as presenters. Um, we are very interested in your suggestions on how to strengthen the value of this training. So please send us your feedback. We are currently finalizing the the rest of the 2019 series both the topics and the schedule. So please keep an eye out for, for those details. Thank you again for your interest and attendance, and we look forward to uh, you joining us on future webinars. I'm checking one last time for any questions. Um, and there are a couple questions that I'm not gonna ask uh, to, the, to the full audience here, but I'll submit them to the specific uh, presenters and they should be able to get back to you um, uh, directly over, over email. So with that, um, this concludes our webinar for today. Uh, thanks for your time and have a good day.